Yes, here we are. <laughs> okay. So I hope everyone uh, got back or um, new audiences uh, had the possibility to come and join us. Uh, my name is Biljana Tanurovska and I'm part of the team of Lokomotiva who is co-organizing this uh, Congress together with Oracle Network. And I have a pleasure now to introduce uh, my dear professor and mentor, Milana Dragičević Šešić who is Professor Emerita, former president of University of Arts in Belgrade. She's also founder of uh, UNESCO Chair in Interculturalism, Art Management and Mediation, where, and uh, Professor of Cultural Policy and Management. And most of us in the region and larger in Europe has been uh, uh, her students. Uh, her work is really large, we cannot, uh, I cannot uh, say everything, but uh, I would just mention the last year uh, a Fellowship Laureate uh, Award by ENCAD she won, and she had this, uh, um, I would say, seminal works in the field of culture and cultural policy. So tonight uh, or today, uh, her lecture, we invited uh, uh, Professor Milana to talk uh, about uh, the question how to overcome cultural divisions in, in illiberal societies for a new ethics of care and solidarity. She will speak and uh, uh, I will leave the floor now just to say a uh, few words about later how we will continue. I will be receiving the questions and uh, I will share with uh, the professor so uh, she can uh, address uh, or she can answer. Questions can come by the attendees so uh, within the Zoom link, but also questions can come from the Facebook. So uh, Professor Milena, thank you so much again for having, uh, for accepting this possibility. Also have, knowing that you are not feeling well at this moment, and I'm sorry for that. I mean, it's not Corona, <laughs> so, but uh, I, and uh, yes, we will be gentle in, <laughs> in okay. the following <laughs> hour. <question. laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, can I share the screen? Am I uh, allowed to share the screen? Yes, uh, Nenad, who is um, our technical support. I'm just can looking how how to do that um, i don't have the option here i don't know why uh -huh. share screen here okay you is. have it probably yes i hope it's going to work okay but for some reason can you can you see it yes yes okay. i can see I decided to devote this lecture to my friend and a longtime colleague, Osman Kavala, who is now who knows more than 1000 days in prison, probably 1200 or 300 days in prison. And what is happening to him, it's exactly part of these divisions in illiberal societies illiberal societies, societies that are at the first glance still uh, kind of democratic, there are elections, there are um, possibilities, but in reality when everything is known in advance and the governments that are uh, leading the society are dividing societies uh, and uh, basically uh, making everything in two groups as a loyal citizens and all those that are against that concrete government, meaning they are against the state, society, everything. And that is the fate of Osman Kavala, which is really one of the Turkish, I would say, cultural activists, uh, uh, in the deepest sense of this word, someone who is businessman, but uh, 
in spite of that, he devotes his life and energy to help less uh, fortunate members of Turkish society, specifically Kurdish population in Diyarbakir. So uh, the topic today, we have to see how artists, curators, and cultural managers are acting in this illiberal society, how they are facing politics, but also market, and even pandemics today. Is there any place for empathy? Is there any possibility to develop really culture of hospitality in the Redian sense of the word, culture of care and culture of solidarity that seems to be more necessary than ever? We can say that uh, in, in the Southeast Europe, what we have as a governance system are hybrid partocratic stabilocracies. These are all kind of new words, partocracy, stabilocracy, and so on. But in fact, it's not only the case in Southeast Europe, it's also the case in India, in Brazil, in USA, in Poland, in Hungary, in many, many countries of the world where the re political regime is centralized and used populist cultural policies and populist rhetorics using all available, first of all, state, institutional, financial, political resources, absolutely compromising anything that can be linked to professionalism, meritocracy, because yes, the word elites is seen as a very, very bad word. Even Orthodox Church, for example, in Serbia is uh, using the words like those false and evil elites and so on. So wanting to say that whoever is raising its critical voice and not accepting uh, things as they are presented by political regimes are in fact false elites and they are guilty for everything. In these hybrid partocratic stabilocracies, there is no transparency as there is no free public media and there is no free media at all. All institutions are usurped, seized. In fact, there is no more real institutions. Everything is uh, uh, governed by one same type of thought. Nativism replaced former socialist cosmopolitanism and uh, from time to time regimes would act as pseudo autocracies, according to Farid Zakaria, demonstrating false liberal tendencies in order to consolidate their regime. With elections that do not have equal conditions for all, they're establishing legitimacy in front of international community. Although most of domestic cultural elites belonging to cultural counter publics alert international public opinion how questionable it is. Remember election in Albania two years or year and something ago, where only 23% of population participated. Uh, elections in Serbia where less than 50% of population participated, or now elections in Venezuela, etc., etc. So uh, even the if the citizenship is boycotting, the appearance of elections that they existed and that they have given chance to citizens and citizens withdraw of taking this chance. So tanpi, and I think it's a something that we have uh, very sincerely to rethink as a method of political, political battle. For cultural policy, definitely we can say that they are on the crossroads because the cultural realm is being challenged all over the world. 
uh, not only because we are in the pandemics and very special situation, but because we live in this so-called post-truth societies where the emotion of the masses once again become the engine of political thought, cultural policies find themselves at a cross, crossroads, would they also use emotions of masses as their own engine? Because during the last period, they were years of political pragmatism in the face of demands of politicians, public bureaucracies, and the press. This period inculcated in us an acceptance of the political scrutiny and evaluation of culture, of evidence-based cultural policies, providing justification for different juries and committees in the ways how public money is spent on art and culture. So last 10 years, we had these imperatives of impacts, of measurable achievement, aiming for some noble causes, inclusion, public health, employment, and economic development. Now, it seems that all these evidence-based cultural policies are again not important anymore, that it's more important the way how emotions of the population can be raised and stimulated uh, by cultural policies and thus, uh, more, uh, uh, how we can say, uh, big monuments uh, building around uh, um, uh, flags all over the cities, because everything which is done have to raise national feelings, patriotism, and um, all of us have to be scared if the accusation for anti-patriotism would, uh, would appear. New populist policies are spreading in all domains, then they are based on emotions, populist rhetorics and communication style. Uh, although their rhetoric is not yet completely prevailing in cultural sector, it is influencing concepts of audiences as consumers, citizens as people, the public interest and demand to policymakers and cultural workers to provide projects for a public realm that require the enthusiasm of the people. It's clear from the project such as Copia 2014 to countless national investments that mimic the Bilbo effect, invoking the spectacularity of the image, effect and past invocations of national greatness. Um, aim of this lecture is to reflect on values that appears in public cultural realm to explore certain dilemmas, controversies, dichotomies that are facing artists, designers, curators, and so on. So, um, and specifically how all those dilemmas are perceived during COVID-19 crisis, where most of cultural institutions and cultural organizations and especially independent cultural sector is forced to withdraw from public life as not all of them have means and uh, possibilities to really enter in the virtual world, not to speak about audiences that even less have enough, uh, how to say, utilities at home and so on to be able to join any kind of cultural event online. Present situation, if we take uh, theory of geopolitics of emotion of Dominic Moisi, that he is speaking about culture of fear, culture of humiliation and culture of hope spread around the globe with the, the definitive predominance of culture of fear in the West, but culture of humiliation in so-called global South. Culture of hope it used to characterize in a certain moment of uh, 21st century, some 
regions of the world, East Asia or Latin America, but we saw how quickly this uh, culture of hope, for example, in Latin America was replaced by both combination of cultural fear and cultural of humiliation, like in Colombia, Venezuela, Brazil, and so on. So what are trends that are dominating from global north toward global south? It's of course globalization, it's migrations, and of course migrations are from global south toward global north. Uh, COVID-19 crisis is equally hitting north and south, east and west, but we now see with the spread of vaccine, to what extent 50% uh, of the vaccines are bought from 14% of the global population countries. So we see that the rich, of course, have more uh, means to protect and defend themselves. We have to also discuss and to see how artists see new labor ethics of mass cultural production in which artwork became extremely precarious, extremely weak, uh, not allowing for, uh, I wouldn't say even decent, but somehow uh, average level of uh, uh, earning income for the, those who are uh, art creators, producers. Journalism is on lowest grades of its profession and cultural journalism nearly disappeared throughout the world. Global warming became mantra which uh, stopped to mean much more than just the mantra, while populism, authoritarianism, and dictatorship and confessional divisions started predominating because populism, in fact, is playing on these social divisions, class division, division in between these evil elites and these fantastic poor people that government is supporting, but unfortunately they live poor, not because of bad government, but because of these bad elites. Playing with confessional divisions more and more uh, is, we, we see that even in uh, European countries, in, uh, when, when I say confessional, I mean also confessional, uh, cultural, linguistic, and all other divisions. We can see now what's going on in between Bulgaria and Macedonia. We saw to what extent uh, elites, uh, church elites, uh, religious elites, cultural elites, political elites are dividing Serbian and Montenegrin population. And we can, uh, what is going on in Bosnia, to what extent society is divided and uh, people are voting in a fear for the parties they think or they pretend are going to defend their confessional and other interests and everything is uh, uh, from the fear of the other. However, in spite of the fact that cultural governance is characterized by technocracy and populism, the importance of arts have risen during COVID-19. So, um, I think we, that, that it was necessary because new public management demanded in cultural sector uh, more uh, economic uh, input, performance measures, efficiency, productivity. So cultural workers and artists, they were forced to become entrepreneurs or to become part of creative industries or to become spectacle for market needs on one side. On the other side, populist policies asked arts and culture for national responsibility, for participation in identity creation processes, or cultural policies 
can mix these two demands. This is the best shown in Serbian competition for film production, where you have a production for commercial films. So the government wants to give money to support commercial film production. The second group, uh, the line, is uh, support to nationally relevant films. Can you imagine what does it mean, nationally relevant film? How you can prove? So of course, nationally re relevant film is not going to be the one that is really challenging the life and the situation today in Serbia. Nationally relevant film is a nice uh, fairy tale about life in medieval Serbia or life in 19th century Serbia and so on. Something that populist governments thinks that is presenting the best way the uh, national spirit, national body and so on. So uh, cultural sector is losing its real space of importance, its critical potential, because illiberal uh, society that is dividing everyone and especially cultural community is position everyone on our intellectual, their intellectual or not intellectual or false intellectual and so on. Um, Okay, we don't have time to go to some of the explore, artistic explorations, but I must think, where is a possibility for critical reflection, for contextual artistic practice, relational artistic practice, or artistic practice with empathy? And um, I put it here, the cover of the book of Milton Glaser and Milton Illich, the Mirko Illich, the design of descent, because I think, yes, everywhere there is a possibility for critical reflection, even in those forms that for a long time had been, con had been considered as part of the dominant uh, political system and so on, such as design was. But I would say that more and more we can find a radical opinions questioning uh, exactly there. All sclerotized patterns of cultural governance were not replaced with those that would put public good and public interest in the heart of the matter. Because only economy seems to be of ultimate public interest. Idea of commons is debated within independent cultural sector, but never in the mainstream. Our cultural institutional system is not even uh, uh, reflecting, are they there to act uh, in public interest? Are they creating public goods? Or to what extent what they can offer is really part of the commons and so on. So it's really more among independent artists that these questions, what constitutes art power, how they can voice, how they can make this art power powerful arise. Here I put this uh, work of Maya Bajevic, an uh, artist from Sarajevo, in between Sarajevo and Paris that is doing kind of a reenactment, but in completely other type of vision and the scope and framework. Art has to be national and artist has to be national. Of course, it's a very ironic statement regarding this Marina Abramovic um, art project, art must be beautiful and artist must be beautiful, uh, which uh, Maya Bajevic is exactly focusing uh, how contemporary uh, po cultural policies, political situation, how they expect to see a role of arts and role, uh, role of artists. In a similar way, uh, Milica Tomic in her seminal work, I Milica Tomic, I'm Bosnian, Norwegian and so on, uh, shows how Arti body of the artist by 
uh, repeating as a mantra these words of uh, uh, national identity. Uh, her body becomes more and more bloody. So the work was even before, I mean, Malouf has written the book, Killing, Killing Identities, Les Identités Mercrières. We don't have much time to go over concepts of hard and negri, but I assume that most of you knows this concept of com commons that uh, we share as humanity all natural resources, but we also have to share all results of human practices such as language, ideas, and arts. So it's up to us to create a framework for a new shared cultural policy, cultural policy and cultural practices that can be enjoyed by everyone. So how we can promoting values such as community sharing, uh, shared governance, citizens participation, citizenship, Otherwise, the word citizenship became just an, one of many empty words that does not mean uh, anything much. How we can, through arts and culture, enhance human dignity, emancipation, collective responsibility, and social, not individual well-being, because the Western or Global North concept is all about individual well-being, but in fact, we have to speak about uh, community cases. So yes, cultural rights should be a central part of cultural policy practice, as culture is a public sphere. But unfortunately, we can see that nearly nowhere cultural policies are defined on cultural rights except when it comes to the ethnic-based cultural rights, meaning collective cultural rights. And then we would like to say our uh, system guarantee that each national minor minority has its rights to create its cultural system and so on. This is only partially following ethics of cultural rights, uh, which again is more dividing than sharing. Division in between ethnic groups and giving them uh, rights to create their own cultural policies is to a certain extent democratic, but in much larger measure, it's ghettoizing isolating and dividing populations in uh, on one same uh, same territory there is also one issue that i would like to uh, debate this is what does it mean to have public initiatives can we join uh, public initiatives with civic imagination uh, are only artists and dependent cultural operators agents of change, or we have to, in, to be much more inclusive to different civil society movements to make kind of platforms for the real civic imagination to be performed. There are now a huge conflicts in between official policies of urban regeneration, official policies of uh, cultural uh, creation, governance, and so on. And uh, on the other side, we have a lot of activistic, self-organized uh, uh, elements in some former neglected neighborhood. But what we see, uh, often is how those citizens' movements are recuperated. And for example, the best or the last example is uh, Savamala in Belgrade, where the process that was initiated by civil society then is retaken completely by huge uh, urban agencies. And uh, there was no to any place for citizens' civic imagination. This is something that we have to be aware of as 
even the best cultural policies and educational policies cannot fight, and we don't see them fighting against uh, uh, much stronger economic policies of the countries, policies of urban regeneration, policies of uh, uh, capitalist, urbanist uh, investment, and so on, and uh, which is basically destroying all this that school system tries with the small and minimum uh, measures to complement, to bring more democracy, social justice, and so on. In fact, the other much more important social and political uh, sources are ruining that. So how we as independent cultural sector can bring collective intelligence together, intellectuals, which are going to enable flows of ideas and civic engagement in cultural space. That is something that is very important in this era of spectacle and consumerism, because culture is a space that might give some voices to new thoughts, to the issues not yet told. It is a space for direct democracy practice uh, that is going to introduce some new forms of intercultural sensitivity, of social distributive justice. We don't even discuss that anymore. What does it really mean, distributive justice and so on? Culture of memory, how we share dissonant and the negative past. We see now that it is going to be politically decided and not by a large scale of social dialogue, what, who was Gotze Delchev? Why it was that certain people in a certain historical periods had to register themselves to be of that or this nation in order to perform their professional practice, in order to become teachers and so on. But this culture of memory that is very often uh, dissonant memory, that is very often uh, um, opening issues of negative past uh, has exactly to be discussed in a cultural platforms within large uh, actions of both creators, but also historians, active, social activists and so on. My, those who had followed me uh, last uh, several years, you know that to what extent I'm obsessed with this idea of counter monuments as participative retelling and reinterpreting the negative past. To what extent it is important that each of us in uh, our own uh, situation uh, debate what used to be past, negative past, that, that we are uh, shamefully trying to uh, not to remember, trying to forget and so on. So can culture become a real regional, local, but also global space of remembrance? Civic imagination definitely is a public good. But no one speaks about it because only those artworks that are done by artists and so on are recognized as something uh, that is public good. If you are not art and cultural professional, whatever you create somehow passes under others and is not part of the uh, processes that should link expert knowledge, artistic explorations with civic imagination. And that is the reason why I think that these kind of seminars are crucially important because cultural managers, members of Oracle Net Network, they are really those to mediate, uh, to link expert knowledge, to link uh, uh, artists, 
uh, exploration, artistic research, and so on, with different social citizen movements that is also creative and putting on the agenda uh, new and important issues. I put here several uh, um, participative projects of citizens or individuals, even for example, uh, Corada Museums and Activities in Siena as the probably oldest, uh, um, oldest uh, endeavors of the citizens' uh, um, imagine, imagination and so on. But you have different, I would say, cultural or artistic projects that even being initiated sometimes by artists like Museum of Innocence of Orkan Pamuk or uh, Perich Talent Museum of Childhood uh, might also be completely a uh, citizen initiative like Museum of Broken Relationship in Zagreb. So uh, this is the way I think we can skip over it what are in fact populist policies. This is the Belgrade, how our uh, politicians would like to see it. Uh, so shiny, glossy, without anything artistic. It's not like uh, lighting the city with artistic projects. It's really lighting the city with the most uh, banal consumeristic lighting lighting equipment. Populist uh, policies, uh, they like aesthetics of uh, spectacularization, commodification. There are no new role models and icons of the new art market. People like Jeff Koons, Damien Hirst, even Marina Abramovic. And that's part of the control controversies that we also have to discuss. And we rarely discuss to what extent the artists that are employing like uh, Olaf Aurelius on 150 people in his artistic atelier, and that is highly appreciated as how art should be today, offering job for many people and so on, to what extent uh, this kind of uh, artistic endeavors are uh, preventing real uh, individual projects, real civil society strategies uh, to, to be developed and to connect with different audiences, with different citizen groups and so on. Uh, civil society, uh, in the last 30 years, went in the Balkans through many different stages of development. And starting at the beginning of the 90s with individual projects, but then developing platforms, uh, institutions such as Tochka in uh, Skopje or CZKD in Belgrade, uh, Mama in Zagreb and so on, as platforms for creation and for sensitivity. And the third phase brought something that was very important and that was the linkage of theory and art practice. And that's something that I would like that we have continuously to lobby for, to be constantly debating and engaging in between artistic practice and artistic theories. Transdisciplinary collaborative projects uh, has to become kind of the standard norm as those projects are uh, involving those audiences that never had chance to be involved in any kind of reflections, consideration, and so on. So this is questioning the chronotope in which we are living. In fact, we are coming to the uh, issues that are 
uh, that I would like to debate today. What does it really today means? Aesthetics of hospitality, cultural hospitality, how we are reacting toward displaced person, toward migrants, toward exilants and so on. Of course, when we look at the Beta Festival, we are going to see fantastic performances that are coming and that are dealing with issues of uh, migrants, exilants, and so on. But in real life, projects such as uh, this one on the right side uh, related to a uh, woman from Srebrenica, so uh, in exile because they are not living in Srebrenica anymore, are rare. Even today, we don't want to be reminded on uh, exile of the people in our own home and homeland, not, not to speak about those who came who knows from where, from Syria, from Afghanistan, from Pakistan to our countries. We don't see much. We saw several uh, acts of hospitality in Berlin Pergamon Museum, for example, or Berlin Philharmonic uh, Ensemble and so on. But aesthetics of hospitality, unfortunately, is not yet practice of, uh, um, of everyday life of cultural organizations. In this time of populist political communication, the language, the discourse of hospitality is losing from its opposite, the discourse of hostility. So Derrida has invented the word hospitality and uh, trying to explain these two cases, hospital and house, and in fact, during this COVID-19 crisis, there were two key institutions uh, for most of the population or to stay locked down in their house or being accepted in a, in a hospital. These three aspects are involved in this ritual of hospitality, an action of welcome, an attitude of the opening of oneself toward the others and the principle of disinteredness. And we can see that very, very rarely we can see these three aspects happening in uh, one, uh, I would say, uh, uh, cultural situation. Cultural and aesthetics of care came to cultural management through feminist uh, culture and aesthetics of care and uh, um, some of the Thompson, for example, introduce it in the theater management uh, practice, uh, wanting to show to what extent uh, culture and aesthetics of care should become today uh, one of the major element of the uh, artistic being of independent performing art organizations and so on. Uh, here aesthetics is contradicting today's focus on aesthetics of suffering, trauma, loss and crisis. That is something that I would like to underline because in many cultural projects and programs, for example, now in Beirut, in Syria and so on, cultural workers are stimulated to deal with trauma, psychosocial work in artistic practice, which is not the point. We have to develop aesthetics of affective solidarity rather than a frequently individualized attention to suffering and loss. I know that we have to uh, uh, come closer to the end of my lecture. I would like to underline the importance of this book about culture of care, participatory art for invisible 
communities that uh, is really developing and writing about cases that are uh, bringing us more closely to the aesthetics, aesthetics of care. And I will uh, just take this uh, uh, reflections on exile of Edward Said, so old book, but if you look at, at this uh, work of art, Kabak of uh, Ilya and Emilia, eternal immigrant, you see, in fact, what we are doing. We are just standing and watching human body trying to go over these walls, which walls might be real, physical, but also might be uh, more uh, intangible and so on. And somehow these exilers are <coughs> caught in this limbo in between the two worlds. They are not yet left their culture and territory, but they are not yet accepted in the new one. And in the most of the cases, they stay in between. It's our duty and our role as cultural operator to try to develop uh, aesthetics of hospitality, of care, and specifically of solidarity, so that through empathy and actions of solidarity, we develop uh, cultural artistic actions, programs that are going to be open, that are going to be, uh, I would say, dialogical, and polemical as much as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Milana. I hope that we can see each other. Yes. Thank you for this uh, complex, uh, I would say, uh, presentation or lecture. Uh, many issues were tackled. I don't know where we can start from, but maybe from the directions that you already kind of uh, proposed. Uh, what uh, maybe I can uh, start with, it's about thinking uh, about this populism that you're talking about. Maybe to talk about the populism today, and it's a very complex issue, is something that as a rhetoric can be found in any different kind of like uh, party division, doesn't matter that it comes from the right or from the left or from even center, also center. Mm -hmm. And, um, but also in some way, uh, what you were uh, talking about, I imagined myself as a part of uh, independent cultural scene as I'm part of for many years, being now in this kind of a liminal space. Not even before we were culture of uh, descent, and nowadays so we are in between finding our ways how to become uh, this uh, culture or become part of this aesthetics of hospitality or of care. We're talking all the time about these code terms, you know, collaboration, co-curating, uh, I don't know, coexisting, about bringing together these spaces of togetherness. Uh, but somehow we are in this uh, liminal limb position because we see every day how this populism is subverting already existing struggles that we have and somehow it's neutralizing, I would say, them. When you said about this uh, example of uh, Sava Mala, I would say, and this is exactly something as an uh, example that I'm thinking of, but also our struggle that we are now talking about this col colorful revolution which happened here, where we are now, we are not even out of that, we are in a limb. We're all the time protesting, but suggesting, advocating, but we cannot see how to come towards something that it's like uh, this uh, uh, 
uh, culture or aesthetics of care and equity or uh, hospitality actually that I wanted to say it's something that it's related with equity it's like something that uh, where equity stands uh, in a position to be thought as a policy but how to get there is the question what would be our tactics <coughs> that we should continue on besides these uh, ongoing processes of, uh, of uh, how to say, of thinking about it. You, you mentioned this like theory and practice, you, you brought some solutions, but maybe you can just say something more. I would say, for example, uh, you had recently uh, Mot Theatre Festival in, uh, Okay. So this kind of uh, platforms might be excellent platforms for encounters that are not so typical of uh, so-called uh, mainstream theaters, kind of mainstream because it's not mainstream festival, it's uh, avant-garde uh, young theater festival and so on, but also of different sorts of opinions. And I think these uh, festivals might be uh, more used, like our BTEF also, or Moto and so on, or MESS, uh, for debating, for making uh, more unusual encounters, not only theater people with theater people, but uh, differently. You, uh, we should invite historians, we should invite uh, uh, architects, we should, and, and so on, and try to make these interdisciplinary encounters and debates, and also to invite groups of audiences that would normally never been part of such festivals. And somehow it's rarely happening. It's really, uh, I would say, for each of us, we don't like to leave uh, our comfort zone. And our comfort zone is zone of collaborative practices among friends. So if we are part of NGO system, we are going to create a, a collaborative platform of different NGOs from the region. And we are, we are going to be very happy and we are going to invite also few of the theoreticians that are close to us so that we are not going to really be uh, challenging in uh, different opinions and thoughts. So we are gathering usually among people that share our values and opinions. Uh, it's very difficult. And that's exactly what populism succeeded in doing, that we know that we don't want to be with this populist governances. And then we try to make our safe and secure spaces where we are going to share same values. Um, I'm also not sure because uh, I wouldn't also gladly go to some encounter where I'm pretty sure that I'm going to hear some opinions that I'm not going to share and so on. But these divisions that are so characteristic for contemporary society, I think we have to try, uh, we must do maximum to overcome these uh, polarized talks, this um, exclusionary talks. And I have to say that it's not only populist uh, discourse that is exclusionary, it's also our democratic discourse because we are very quickly uh, giving, uh, how would say, we just say, ah, he's uh, stupid, he's populist, he's regime, he is this or he is that. So when we speak about aesthetics of care, it's a care about everyone, about the different, about the other. Difficult. Yes. Uh, what you uh, uh, talk about uh, reminds me actually on what uh, Chantal Move is actually talking, that we need to create this culture of this census. And she talks that everything is political, also the 
art uh, is political. So either it's going to, I don't know, remind us all of the reality or it's going to reflect and change the reality. So uh, the, the change is possible only in this census, only if we come together with the different adversaries and create this possibility as you are also talking about and advocating that we can talk and discuss our differences and kind of change the position. Okay, sorry, now uh, Aida ask you, what was the name of the book of the professor Milena? Maybe I can say it's a participatory art for invisible communities. It was the book about the care. Um, and uh, yes, I thought it's a question. Another question that comes, so I stopped myself. It's the... a book that was uh, uh, done by Irena Sertic from Croatia. So, and I think it's available on the web. So it, it was electronic edition. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe someone, I would like to invite the audience. Uh, we have... Uh, around 20, uh, including us, uh, attendees, participants. participants, yes, and also probably someone maybe from uh, the Facebook or social media, I would rather say. Do you have any questions? Mm -hmm. Maybe I can just also ask you related to what I already said. Uh, you talked about uh, different trends and you talked about that some of the trends are forgotten. We always juggle with this uh, cultural policy which is disappearing and this is the cultural policy of evidence-based evidence -based cultural policy. How to, how to uh, uh, kind of relate to this historical thing, historical like uh, uh, notions and uh, uh, trends of cultural policy that we are missing uh, and how to relate to something that would be maybe the cultural policy of equity. It's uh, interesting to see to what extent uh, different governments throughout Europe uh, are in uh, have learned to misuse anything that is brought by, for example, UNESCO or, or, or mm. so on. So for example, <coughs> new trends in cultural policy has absolutely to be engaging civil society mm. in uh, making uh, measures for cultural policy, but also in evaluating and reporting to UNESCO every four years about cultural policy development regarding contemporary art. Mm -hmm. And uh, with few of my colleagues, we really made the analysis how it really works. And basically it was shown from the Nordic countries to the South, a little bit less uh, less falls in the north, but still quite, uh, uh, it's um, the reporting or, and dialogue with civil society during the process of analysis of cultural policy and reporting is so formal by chosen association, by chosen so-called good and positive civil society. So it's never, genuine process of a dialogue, and dialogue means conflictual dialogue, dialogue where you have to debate, not, not a dialogue. Uh, government uh, said we are going to have this and this measure and civil society said bravo, uh, which very often is, uh, is the case. So for me, it was really fantastic to see to what extent uh, the, the um, any kind of uh, positive uh, policy recommendation can be turned in its opposite misusing, uh, uh, for example, also uh, public media. The importance of public media for art, creative 
art uh, culture development and so on is uh, definitely one of these five elements of the convention 2005 of unesco but in fact consequently in all countries the role of public media in the sphere of arts and culture has terribly diminished terribly diminished because the, the um, uh, legal systems are just uh, uh, preoccupied with the fact that the public media are not uh, politically biased and so on. But in fact, to, to defend its obligation and duty to be promoter of art and culture, it's totally neglected in spite of the big words, proclamation, and so on. Thank you, Milana. We have Marta coming with us here to ask you directly <laughs> a question. So please, Marta Novitska, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Milena, for your fabulous lecture, as always. <laughs> I think I will uh, re-listen to it once again uh, to follow up with all the links and names that you mentioned. Uh, it was really inspiring. But um, I had this experience, quite recent one, uh, that uh, really vibrated with your, uh, your uh, speech today. And we had this fantastic project about shaking the walls, about uh, creating dialogue between different cultures and different communities uh, in few countries that participated within this EU project. And in the beginning of the project, I was absolutely sure that what we need to do in order to diagnose our situation is to create a debate a debate between people who don't agree with each other. Okay. <laughs> so we will not preach to the choir, right? Uh, and uh, we decided that we will have great artists, a great teacher, but also linguist. Uh, that was, uh, let's say, um, connected to the left wing ideology, very much so. Uh, but we also invited right wing politician and a priest, uh, also a professor of theology. So we had four panelists from totally different backgrounds, two from each side, let's say, all very open to the dialogue. And they, they really agreed to speak, to, to listen to each other. I thought it's great, but what happened? Uh, when we started the debate, the audience came. It was open and the audience uh, thought about our action as a threat to their values. Ah, okay, to their, and, so only their values is good, are good. Yes, and the people start, some people came drunk, some people came violent. The situation came, uh, went out of control of our hands and I felt ethically responsible for, for what happened because it was great debate with terrible ending. And uh, my question to you is, is there any um, solution, any, any advice that you could give us how to prepare our audience for the actions, even if we people who create the art are ready? That's just showing to what extent situation in society in Poland is polarized. So that people are already, how it say, it's the same in Serbia, it's same in many other countries, that uh, uh, they are always under stress that this other is going to endanger this small space of our freedom or whatever, yeah? So people are not ready to any kind of dialogue. No, au contrary, they are uh, avoiding uh, to be uh, uh, facing so-called the other and opposition. So how to fight to change that? Uh, only to, with a really better preparation, preparation in telling in advance, we want to we invited people that do not represent extremes of both spheres. And that might be somehow 
uh, because very often media, in order to raise uh, spectacularity, sensationalization, and so on, they deliberately ask for extremes. So they enjoy if the people would start fighting in front of cameras and so on. So the audiences are very used to this kind of uh, uh, challenging uh, fight and no one has um, uh, tolerance and time to listen to the slow ongoing debate and so on. So I would say we need a lot more work to introduce to our audiences this step-by-step -step cultural debate. Yes, uh, thank you, Milena. Thank you, Marta. Just to, to kind of relate to the last week debate we had here in Macedonia, we named it Let's Forget on the Fights from the Past. It's kind of a translation from uh, Brecht. But the thing is that, uh, uh, is it about the forgetting or just building, as you said, Milena, this environment in which we can face the different encounters probably. But there is a, another I think what I wanted to maybe just open until the, as the end, because I see that uh, I, we don't have a question still. Uh, it's about this uh, danger of the, um, I would say the marriage between the state and the market. And this is where the populism and all these kind of like, um, uh, uh, additional things that we are facing every day, these polarities also are uh, there. So how, how, how actually to act when we have this big power on these both sides, especially as a civil society, or as you said, uh, as a civil, 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 I mean, citizens, what is this civic imagination that you're talking about, how it can maybe help us in this? I think that has to be something also done, uh, especially starting with the public cultural sector. If the museums, for example, open up to the civil society, if they ask uh, to people, common people to contribute something, artifact, virtual artifact, and so on, from their imaginary, from their value system, and so on. That is uh, so that the people can start feeling that they are asked, that they are somehow taken in account, not only as audiences to whom we are uh, sending messages, but also that we are asking them to produce their message, their um, about idea of the past, idea of uh, future and so on, then we are going to have more active citizenship. And only more active citizenship is going to be more creative and more tolerant citizenship. <coughs> Thank you again, Professor Milan. I think that this was a very good end. And uh, I, as I see, there is no other, there are no other questions coming. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank you again in the name of organizers as Locomotiva, but also Oracle Network. And uh, I would like to ask everyone who is now attending, but also others which are interested to follow the programs on our social media and the next, dis uh, and the next uh, discussions uh, which are coming on the program tomorrow. Thank Goodbye. you. Bye. Bye-bye.